Wilson Burns took a deep sip of coffee as he sat down in his chair. There was a stack of old newspapers and a file folder filled with reports that had been haphazardly shoved inside of them. There were dozens of sticky notes scattered throughout the pages on his desk, with reminders to file something or call someone or check the balance of his account and see if he had been paid yet. He had a desk organizer to hold his various pens, markers, and highlighters, but he never put them away, and he always had to dig through a mountain of loose pages to find a writing utensil. His computer wasn't much better. He had covered it with sticky notes too, and although there was a file on the computer to neatly archive all his old files, he never moved them over when he finished, and he was forever having to sort through old files to find the ones he wanted. He had eight or nine tabs open at a time on his web browser, four of which were usually the company website, and two of the remaining ones were always his online accounting program. He had several notes to sort through old invoices to verify that they were correct, but he never seemed to find the time. It wasn't his fault. He had never been good at secretary work. His mind worked too quickly, and it was easy to forget little details. His brain always tried to lay out a rough outline of whatever he was doing, and then he could go and fill in the details later. Besides, it was hard to keep track of all the little organizational things. He hated having to file something in one place, and then record it half a dozen times in eight different places just to find out he forgot to check a stupid box somewhere. It was maddening. Somewhere in his mind, he knew that if he could just organize his thoughts a little better, his business would be much more successful and his life would be easier. But that just wasn't how his mind worked. Good bookkeeping was a job in and of itself, and it took away from his real work anyways. With a sigh, Wilson began sorting through his notes. It took him four hours to clean it all up, and he knew Ruth would scold him when she got back about ruining her system. Still, it was passably clean when he was done, and he had even managed to find a pen. After he had organized everything, he went over to the safe and pulled out a large black ledger and the two pens that he kept with it. It was the only thing in his whole office that was neat and orderly, and it was meticulous. He couldn't work with the computer. It was too foreign to him. The ledger, though, that he knew, and he kept a flawless record in that book. He began studiously making notes in the ledger in black and red ink. No sooner had he finished making notes than his dial phone rang. His head jerked up, and he looked over at it. It had a caller ID, but he never trusted the thing to work. Half the time it would give him a name that was completely wrong. The new phone annoyed him to no end, and he kept meaning to replace it with an older phone, but he always forgot. He reached for the phone and grabbed it out of its cradle, but it was behind the computer monitor, and it hit the screen and bumped the end call button as he tried to raise it to his ear. He cursed under his breath and tried to answer the phone, but it was just a blank dial tone. He cursed again and hung up the phone, moving it in front of the monitor. A few seconds later, his pocket buzzed, and he pulled out his cell phone. There was a text on the screen. He unlocked his phone and put on reading glasses. Ruth had texted him, and he read it aloud. Willie, there are two new jobs for you, he read. Give them a call and try not to make a mess. He began rummaging through his desk for a pad of paper as he copied the numbers down onto the yellow line pages. After giving the number a call, he began excitedly tearing apart the office to find the morning paper. After making another mess to rival the first one, he found the paper and smacked it with the back of his hand as he read the front page. It was a missing person case. One of the town residents had been gone for a couple of days and the police hadn't found much of anything. The other case was a kid who had been missing his dog for almost a week. He felt for the poor kid who had lost his pet, but he put it on the back burner, especially since he was doing it pro bono. He would find the dog later, but he had a real case to solve first. Wilson pulled into the Sumerian Samples. It was a hipster brewery that offered taste-testing tours. They thought they were being clever naming the brewery after the Sumerians because they invented beer. As far as Wilson could tell, it was just another preppy brewery meant for alcoholics in their mid-twenties. The beer tasted like distilled urine, the ale tasted like it had been brewed in a used toilet, and the smell made him want to curl his nose. Still, it was popular with a lot of younger people, including Johnny Roberts, who had visited the brewery before he had disappeared. The police had already checked the place, but Wilson figured it was best to start from the start. He stepped inside and greeted the man at the door. He was a tall, thin, black man with a pair of wireframe glasses. He wore the brewery uniform and a name tag that said Charlie. Hello, Wilson said. I'm Mr. Burns. I believe I spoke with someone on the phone about answering some questions. That'd be me, Charlie said, extending his hand. Wilson shook it. You wanted to talk about Johnny, right? That's right, Wilson said, letting go of the man's hand. Did you know him well? Yeah, Charlie said. He was a regular. He came here all the time. Between you and me, I think he only comes here to talk to our waitress, Sandy. Sandy? Does she know him too? Wilson asked. Charlie laughed. Too well, he said. The poor girl can't seem to get rid of the guy. But it wasn't like he was being creepy or anything. And he was a paying customer, so there wasn't much she could do. 
Wilson jotted down a few notes on his notepad and looked back at Charlie. Do you think I could meet her at some point? Wilson asked. I'd like to ask her some questions, too. You'd have to come back tomorrow, Charlie said. Today's her day off. I understand, Wilson said. So what do you know about Johnny? About as much as anyone else, Charlie said. He was a regular. He was an accountant. He liked a good drink, and he went missing two nights ago. Wilson nodded and kept taking notes. Did he seem to be acting out of the ordinary the night he went missing? Can't say I remember, Charlie said. But then he began wagging his finger. Although, I do remember him saying he thought the newest beer tasted strange. I didn't think to tell the police because a lot of people thought the beer was bad that night. But he didn't think it was bad. He specifically said it was strange. Did he say what he meant? Wilson asked, leaning in to hear better. Charlie shook his head. No, but he didn't stick around long after that. Wilson nodded and followed Charlie on a tour of the brewery. He asked a few questions, but there was very little he thought was actually helpful. He wanted to leave as soon as he heard Charlie's story about Johnny, but he stuck around as a courtesy. The kid showed him the bar, the distillery, the fermenters, and the area where they kept their best brews. Charlie offered him a sip, and Wilson took it, doing his best not to make faces. It was disgusting. But the kid had been nice and had taken the time to answer his questions, so he did his best to hide his disdain for the brewery. After the tour was done, he left the brewery and followed the road towards Johnny's house. It was a long, winding road, and he could easily imagine a drunken Johnny Roberts crashing his car somewhere where no one had found it yet. Still, if the kid was right, Johnny wasn't drunk. It didn't seem likely that he would get into a crash. He followed the road and kept his eyes peeled, but he didn't expect to find anything. About halfway through the drive, he realized he had been paying too much attention to the road and not enough to his directions. He was distracted and didn't hear the directions from his phone, causing him to take a wrong turn. He swore at his own stupidity, but the map redirected him along a different route, and he decided to stick with it. This time, he paid attention to both the road and his map, trying not to take another wrong turn. He drove down the road quickly, trying to make it to the guy's house, and he had to slam on his brakes to avoid hitting a dog that had run out into the road. He avoided hitting the dog and honked at it to get it out of his way. He looked away from the dog as it scrambled off the road, and he tried to control his frustration. As he glanced away from the road, though, he saw that the gate to the quarry had been knocked off its hinges. He raised an eyebrow and drove towards the quarry. The gate was solid enough that it wouldn't have just fallen over. Wilson could tell someone had broken into the quarry. He doubted it was an emergency. The quarry had been closed for a while, and there wasn't anything valuable inside. Still, it was a safety concern, and he figured he should check it out. Once he was inside the quarry, he saw tire tracks. He felt a sinking feeling in his gut, but he followed the tracks. He followed them into the quarry, right up until they went over the edge. He turned off his car and walked over to the edge. Sitting at the bottom of the quarry was Johnny's car. The police showed up to investigate the area, but as far as they were concerned, it was case closed. Johnny had been drunk, taken a wrong turn, lost control, and ended up at the bottom of the quarry pit. It was tragic, but not surprising. Wilson still wasn't convinced. He had been sure that the guy wasn't drunk. Something else had to have happened, but what else could have explained it? Besides, as far as the police were concerned, it was job well done. He could take his pay and go home, but they didn't need him snooping around the area. Wilson didn't like it, but he knew there wasn't much he could do. Instead, he decided to turn his attention to the missing dog. Toby was a lovable setter who never met a person he didn't like. Unfortunately, there were tons of people in the big white world, and Toby wanted to meet them all. He had a habit of running away and getting himself into trouble. According to the woman who owned the dog, he had gotten out before, but he had never been missing for longer than a day, and her son was beginning to worry. He asked her if the dog had anywhere in particular he liked to go when he ran off, and she said the dog liked the local golf course, and the owners had brought him back more than once. But this time, they hadn't found him. Wilson decided the golf course was the best place to start, and he walked up to the main building to talk to the owner. When he got inside, he found out that the owner wasn't in, but the groundskeeper was. He was a middle-aged man, with sun-tanned skin and rubber boots and waders. His name was Grant, and he gave Wilson a firm handshake. Well, hello, Grant said, wiping the sweat from his brow. I hear you wanted to ask about the stray dog that likes to get loose on our course. That's about the long and short of it, Wilson said. I figured you might be able to tell me a thing or two about it. Grant shrugged. It's an awful lot of trouble to go to for a dog, but I'll tell you what I can. Wilson nodded gratefully. I appreciate it, he said. Well, he's a sweet dog, and friendly too, Grant said, but he has a habit of causing trouble. How so? Wilson asked. Well, aside from the fact that he runs off once or twice a month, he causes problems with the golf course, Grant said. He looked like he could still see the animal loose on the green. I have to keep the course nearly perfect, or the customers will be angry. No one wants to lose a ball or miss a shot because some dog was digging for moles. And that's another thing. 
I had to start laying out traps and poison and whatnot just to deal with those vomits. I've got enough problems with the rodents, I don't need dog problems too. Is that why the dog likes to come here? Wilson asked. Because of the moles, I mean. Well, that, and because it's a wide open space with some ponds and some people, Grant said, scratching his chin. And did you ever do something to try and get rid of the dog? Wilson asked. Shoot him with a BB or chase him off? Grant scowled and waved his hand dismissively. No, we didn't ever mistreat him or anything, he said. We just bribe him with the treat and call his owners. Why didn't he come for a treat this time? Wilson asked. Oh, heck if I know, Grant said. All I know is that I had my hands full with the moles, and a stray dog wasn't all that important, even if he was friendly. Wilson nodded. Do you know which way he went after he ran off? Grant nodded and pointed. There's a hole in the fence over there, he said. I think that's where he gets in and out. Wilson thanked the man and walked over to the fence. It was a picket fence, with faded peeling paint. There was a slat of wood in the fence that was loose, and it definitely looked big enough for a dog to squeeze through. As he got closer, he knew there was no way he could fit through it, and he knew he would have to go around the long way, but he saw something on the ground that piqued his interest. It was halfway under a bush, and he nudged it with his shoe. It came rolling out, and he saw a half-eaten mole. He sighed. Clearly, the dog had managed to find a snack. He figured he'd have to give up soon and call a dog catcher instead, but he wanted to look on the other side of the fence first and see if he could pick up the dog's tracks. He kicked the mole through the fence and made his way around to the entrance. He began working his way around the outside of the golf course until he found the dead mole. Then he looked around to see if there were any paw prints or holes, or anything that might tell him where the dog went. A quick glance told him that it was a dead end, though, and he turned to walk back to his car. As he walked back, though, he glanced up and raised an eyebrow. There was something in the distance that caught his eye. It had been there the whole time, but it stood out to him in that moment. A few blocks away from the golf course, he could see the Sumerian Samples Brewery. His eyes narrowed, and he walked back into the golf course until he found Grant again. Hi there, he said. Back again so soon? Well, I was about to leave, but I thought of another important question, Wilson asked. What mole poison do you use? Grant showed Wilson the maintenance shed, and Wilson inspected the mole poison. You don't think the dog ate any, do you? he asked. I doubt it, Wilson said. I was just spinning some crazy theory. Grant nodded doubtfully, but he didn't press the issue. Wilson thanked him again and left for his car. When he got in, he made a phone call to the city morgue. The phone rang for a while until the pathologist answered him. Hello? the man asked. Hi, Clyde. It's Wilson, he said. Willie! Clyde said excitedly. What can I do for you? Well, I need to ask a favor, Wilson said. That guy they just pulled out of the quarry. Can you check him for a chemical called strychnine? Mold poison? Clyde asked, sounding surprised. Call it a hunch, Wilson said. Give me a call if you find anything. I need to go follow the lead. Clyde sighed. All right. But you owe me a drink. I thought you quit drinking, Wilson said. What can I say, Willie? You bring out the best of me. Wilson pulled up behind the brewery. It was late afternoon, and the place was alive with workers. Still, the owner had made time for Wilson. He wasn't exactly happy, but when Wilson had threatened to call the health department, the owner caved. He greeted Wilson as he got out of his car. The man was tall and slender, with slick black hair and a pencil mustache. He looked like a butler from a cartoon. Well, Mr. Burns, the owner said, I don't have all day, so please explain your business so we can get this over with. Well, Mr. Pickett, Wilson said, I think you have a pest problem. Don't be ridiculous, he said. We take health code violations very seriously. If there were a pest problem, it would have been dealt with already. Humor me, Wilson said, rolling his eyes. Can you show me where you keep the mash for your beer? Mr. Pickett complained the whole time, but he led the way to the mash. This is completely absurd and unnecessary. They entered a warehouse, and Mr. Pickett waved his arms around in exasperation. Well, is that what you wanted to see? Not quite, Wilson said, walking through the warehouse. Can you show me the mash from the beer three nights ago? Of course, he said, walking over to the container. But there are no pests there, I can assure you. Mr. Pickett showed Wilson the container. It was a large plastic tote with a two-foot-wide lid, designed to hold over two tons of mash. Mr. Pickett kept prattling on about safety and health standards, but Wilson ignored him and shined a flashlight against the tote. He frowned when he saw something shadowy inside. He began climbing up on the tote, and Mr. Pickett began to protest. Mr. Burns, get down from there before you get hurt. I will not be liable for you. Wilson popped the lid off the tote and looked down to see Toby floating in the mash in the container. He must have climbed up on scaffolding and fallen into the tote. Well, you might not be liable for me, Wilson said but you might be liable for Johnny Roberts. Mr. Pickett became even more flustered and pulled Wilson off the container, climbing up to see inside for himself. 
When he saw the dog, he shrieked in horror. Wilson chuckled as his phone buzzed in his pocket. He answered it. Hello? He asked. Willie! It's Clyde! The man answered. Hey, Clyde. What's up? Forget the drink and buy me a lottery ticket, he said excitedly. How did you know Johnny Roberts had ingested bull poison? Wilson glanced at Mr. Pickett, who was panicking over the dead dog. Call it a lucky guess, 